titled 13th, 2022. Uh, please enter that room um, at the end of the day and the link for the daily survey will be right there for you to go to. So we appreciate any and all feedback. Um, really, this conference is for all of you. And so your feedback is not only important to us, it's crucial for us to plan next year's event. Um, okay, so let me, allow me to introduce the next panel. I'm very uh, proud and honored to uh, be part of this panel and part of this work, um, supporting cultural continuity through the Indigenous Collections Care Guidance. And today's panelists um, are Marla Taylor. Uh, Marla represents the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology. Uh, Laura Bryant, who represents the Gilgrease Museum. Angela Neller, the Wanapum uh, Heritage Center. Uh, Caitlin Trammell, the University of Nebraska State Museum. Myself and Nicolette Meister, who represents the Logan Museum of Anthropology at Beloit College. And Lords Henry de, de Leon, who uh, represents Central Washington University. The heart of every museum is in its collections expressed through avenues of stewardship, education, exhibition, and research. For decades, museums and academic institutions have been the accepted authority on indigenous people's material culture. This structure is built uh, on the foundations of colonization that show the public aversion of history that is often disconnected from the very people the institution seeks to educate about. The values expressed in museum collection stewardship resonate throughout the entire institution. The Indigenous Collections Care Working Group advocates for different methodologies of collection stewardship that centers concepts of culturally appropriate care and privileges our Indigenous knowledge. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Marla Taylor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, just before we start, we just wanted to say that um, following Angeline is a tough act to follow. And she really set a tone for the day that we hope we can kind of carry forward with our presentation. Um, so please don't compare us to her. <laughs> but we're here today to talk about that cultural continuity is really greater than preservation and the work that we've been doing to develop an indigenous collections care guide. And this topic and presentation particularly feel really timely after Melanie's announcement this morning, as the new proposed regulations do have a section in there that speaks about the duty of care for museums as they steward materials and ancestors subject to NAGPRA. So with that in mind, I, I feel like our talk is gonna have a little bit more relevance today as well. So just to introduce myself, I'm Marla Taylor, the Curator of Collections at the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology. So the Peabody Institute is part of Phillips Academy, which is a private boarding high school in Andover, Massachusetts, and was founded in 1901 by Robert S. Peabody. Um, and the Peabody Institute is home to a large collection of archaeological and ethnographic material from across the Americas, with the vast, excuse me, with the vast majority being Native American in origin. Um, and the Institute itself is really uh, united around concepts of stewardship and education because we are part of a high school. So I've been at the Peabody for over 14 years, and as my role grew and shifted, I was able to take more ownership of how the collection was housed and treated. Um, and in the past few years, the Peabody has worked to complete a full physical inventory of the collection, implement a research policy that requires consultation, and we're working on um, a building housing upgrade as well. Um, and that's what kind of led me into this work. Good morning, everyone. My name is Laura Bryant, and I'm the Anthropology Collection Steward and NAGPRA Coordinator at Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa. Uh, Gilcrease houses approximately 300,000 paintings, sculptures, sketches, manuscripts, and cultural items from deep time through today um, from throughout the Americas. Gilcrease is currently in a moment of transformation as we are changing the way we approach and practice curation, programming, and care by focusing on and serving communities and as we are currently undergoing a reconstruction project. So these are the renderings of our future museum. Um, when I first started at Gilcrease about 10 years ago, the only collection staff were two registrars and a part-time conservator. Volunteers did most of the collection stewardship work, including housing and inventorying with very little oversight. 
Since then, we have greatly grown the collection staff and have professionalized the department. Included in this process was a shift to being more proactive in working with tribes and towards repatriation. During NAGPRA consultations, conversations came up about care protocols and access restrictions. And as we learned more from communities during these consultations, I recognized we needed to change how we, how we approach collections care as a whole and really prioritize this work. Um, as we grow in our relationships through consultations and regular communication, we actively seek guidance from communities on caring for their items. <laughs> Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Angela Neller and I'm a Native Hawaiian. I have 33 years of experience in museum curation. For 20 of those years, I've been the curator at the Wanapum Heritage Center. I became interested in the project that we're presenting about today to make a change in the practice of museums. Um, I bring to the ICC my identity as a Native Hawaiian woman and professional with experience in curation and repatriation. I'm in a unique position as an Indigenous person working for a different Indigenous group to care for their cultural heritage. I am both an outsider to the culture I work for and an insider in understanding an Indigenous value of collections for connection. I work with the Wanapum to apply cultural care practices. Their tribal museum honors their rights to place and gives voice to their spiritual and religious responsibilities. My responsibility is to elevate their indigenous voice and act in deference to their needs and concerns in stewarding their heritage. Hi, I'm Caitlin Trammell and I'm the Anthropology Collection Manager at the University of Nebraska State Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is located on the past, present, and future homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, Ota, Missouri, Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Kaw peoples, as well as the relocated Ho-Chunk, Iowa, and Sac and Fox peoples. At the UNSM, we steward over 40,000 ethnographic and archaeological objects from around the world. And my goal as collection manager is to be of service to Indigenous communities and to prioritize their preferences in our collection care. Um, Ani Bojo, again, I think everyone might know me here, but um, uh, I'd like to introduce myself in the language. Uh, Ani Bojo, Wapshke, Sinikwe, Indigenous Cause, Makana, Minasing, and Donjaba, Gitji, and Ozagagin, the Da. Um, Danja Bomb Cock Makina Menacing, uh, Sagana and Ginjin Dottis, Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians in Dota Bandaguas, Michigan Dodem, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Kwe, and Dao. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited uh, to see you on our third and final day of the conference here. Um, I'm a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians, uh, about six hours north of here is our home, our home base. And I'm the program director with the Association on American Indian Affairs. And prior to starting with the association, I worked at the tribal government level uh, for my tribe um, doing NAGPRA and repatriation work. And so I was happy to join the ICC and provide any uh, direction and support that I could give. Uh, Miu, that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Nicolette Meister and it's an absolute honor and privilege to be here today. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I serve as director and NAGPRA coordinator for the Logan Museum of Anthropology, which is located in Beloit, Wisconsin. The Logan Museum is one of two academic museums on the campus of Beloit College, which, which occupies the ancestral homelands of the Ho-Chunk, Meskwaki, Potawatomi, Sauk, and their predecessors. I also teach collections management and care in our undergraduate museum studies program and direct a summer professional development program called the Center for Collections Care, which provides hands-on training in collections care for emerging and practicing museum, library, and conservation professionals. My involvement in the ICC working group stems from my long-term commitment to inclusive collections management and care practices and the shared responsibility that I carry to respectfully steward indigenous collections. And of course, my acknowledgement of the fraught history of anthropology museums for which the Logan Museum is one. Um, in addition, the Center for Collections Care hopes to offer an online class focused on culturally relevant stewardship, which we hope will further normalize uh, the work of traditional care practices. Thank you. 
Um, hello, uh, my name is Laura Tenebrae de Leon. I'm the Niagara Program Director and Professor in the Anthropology Department at Central Washington University. I have over 20 years of Niagara experience. Um, my relationship with the Washington, Oregon, Idaho tribes was born from the Niagara, matured when I opened the door and has aged into a robust relationship, collaborating on tribal driven projects. And I bring the outsider perspective to the present discussion. All right, thank you. It's an honor to be on the stage here with everybody. Um, and so we're here today to talk about, you know, indigenizing collections care, which is a topic that a lot of you are already going to understand, but we do want to take a moment to define what we're talking about so that we're all approaching it with the same lens. Um, so indigenizing your collections care means acknowledging that Native American cultural items need to be cared for physically, intellectually, and spiritually. It impacts the language that museum professionals use when referring to and describing items and spaces. It affects how you think about access and what materials you use around an item. And it changes how you view, behave around and interact with collections. I know there's really power to this approach and it sets the foundation for a relationship with tribal communities. It can help establish trust and is a step in the healing process that um, so many of us are on a journey for. And it's part of mutual respect and benefits everyone. So the NAGPRA law itself provides a framework to affiliate and repatriate the ancestors and associated funerary belongings, but it doesn't address the needs of those belongings or ancestors or sacred items or items of cultural patrimony before they return home or those outside the law of NAGPRA. So what we're talking about today is work that is very related to repatriation, but it's also next to repatriation and beyond that. So respectful care and privileging indigenous knowledge and relationships are absolutely vital to the transformation of collection stewardship practices in museums and institutions. The community connections from this work contribute to cultural and community healing and is a commitment to being a good ancestor for future generations to come. And as I said, with the new proposed language that was released today, it's kind of embedded in, in the regulations for NAGPRA now in a meaningful way. So I feel like uh, this is the audience who already knows why this is important. Um, but uh, for decades, as you all know, museums and academic institutions have been the accepted authority on indigenous material culture. And the structure is built on the foundations of colonization that show the public a version of history that is often disconnected from the descendant communities and indigenous knowledge. Museums should work to commit to privileging indigenous communities as the experts and prioritizing their knowledge and voices for culturally appropriate collections care. Once you take the steps to begin this work, it inevitably ripples out to affect an entire institution. By changing how we care for indigenous collections, we can change the way museums operate in meaningful and important ways. There's already some amazing work that's happening um, in the field along this vein. Um, so there are a few examples listed here. Um, the core standards for museums with Native American collections uh, will serve uh, to guide all aspects of work within, muse within museums holding Native collections. Um, so one of the things they're trying to do is really affect the American Alliance of Museums core standards um, that kind of set the baseline for, uh, for museums and affect accreditation. Um, it's still in the development and vetting stages, but, um, but they are actively working on it. Um, this document really values uh, the core standards, um, really examines the values and perspectives museums should embrace in this practice. And it really complements the guide that we're going to be talking about today, which focus on, focuses on the practical application of those, um, of those values. There's also the guidelines for collaboration, which were developed by the School for Advanced Research, SAR. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the guidelines, um, but they're intended as a resource for museums and communities planning and carrying out collaborative work. 
Um, the documents don't present a set of rules, um, but offer principles and considerations for building successful collaborations and meaningful consultations. And so um, a lot of the things discussed in the guidelines really complement um, what is in the guide that we're gonna be discussing today. We don't go into a lot of detail on how to have a successful consultation or collaborative project because the guidelines really address that well. Um, another resource are the protocols for Native American archival materials um, and also the uh, local contacts and enriched CI groups um, that are working on TK, TK labels and different things like that. So there are a lot of uh, projects that are adjacent to this work, um, but this is really kind of filling in a bit of a niche. All right. So... Laura and I met each other at ATOM, uh, which I'm gonna assume most of you know what that is, in 2019, and discovered a shared interest in working to incorporate collections care requests from indigenous communities into our institutional practice and policy. You know, we had different frames and needs for this work at our institutions, but we did share that as a goal. So we independently decided to reach out and look for examples of policies in the museum world. And we talked to some colleagues that we have, and we discovered again, independently that there were hardly any actual policies at institutions that we had spoken to that addressed um, cultural care needs. There's mainly general vague language and collections policies like items will be treated with dignity or respect which is great, but like whose dignity, you know, what is respect? You need to kind of, those are nice words, but that doesn't actually mean much, you know? Uh, we also encountered individuals who indicated a desire to do this work, but they didn't know where to start. They didn't know who to talk to. They didn't know how to think about it. Um, and this really felt to us like a gap in museum collections scholarship and practice that we wanted to explore and see if there was a, a place that we could fill in. And it, I'm sure many of you are aware, other parts of museums like exhibit development and public programming have been working within the broader decolonization movement and have made some headway of like collaborative education units, collaborative exhibitions, but collection stewardship has largely been left out of many of these efforts and it's just beginning to be tapped in the broader movement. So in November of 2020, Laura and I presented our research and thoughts to the NAGPRA Community of Practice group, and we received some really positive feedback. And we could tell from the conversations within the community of practice and within our other museum colleagues that there was an interest in developing and having a tool to guide museums and museum professionals to think about and discuss these issues. So the guide that we're talking about today is meant to fill the gaps that we found. So after that 2020 presentation, Laura and I put out a call to gauge interest in developing an informal working group to explore what might, what might come of these conversations. And the response was actually really overwhelming in a really positive way. We heard from a lot of people who wanted to have this conversation. And it seemed like we had kind of created a space to have a conversation that people were asking for. <laughs> Um, so since then, uh, the group membership has slightly fluctuated, but a core group of about 20 people, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous museum professionals and academics, tribal historic preservation officers or representatives from those offices, and NAGPRA coordinators on both sides, tribal and museum representatives, actively participate in monthly meetings on the creation of an Indigenous collections care guide. So our first conversations focused on community building and establishing our goals and objectives for the rest of our conversations. And once we laid that groundwork, we began working on the creation of the ICC, the Indigenous Collections Care Guide, focusing on caring for Native American cultural items in museums and research institutions. And just to clarify, we are defining museum kind of the way that NAGPRA defines museum, that we hope this will also be helpful for federal uh, repositories in some way also. So what is the end product? <clears throat> so we're working on creating a reference tool for people who interact regularly with indigenous collections, including all levels of experience and exposure. The guy, it, this is important, the guy will not instruct museums on how to specifically care for each item since instructions and protocols vary among communities. It will instead offer questions and subjects communities want to be asked and considered, as well as some templates for implementation. This work can be initiated on any level or by any staff member and become integrated into the foundation of the larger institution. This guide should serve as a reference during that journey. 
This guide in no way replaces consultation. Instead, it is meant to help guide those conversations by providing a framework for topics to discuss during consultation. We aim to reframe collection stewardship of Indigenous collections. All information in the guide will be presented in practical and accessible language and will be accompanied by a robust set, set of appendices with templates, case studies, examples, etc. We hope to also eventually create teaching and training resources and workshops related to the guide um, and this approach to collection stewardship, but those are still in the early concept phases. So what will actually be in the guide? The guide will address the specific sections you see here. Not all of them are written yet, we're still drafting, um, but this is what the group has outlined as the broad topics to be covered. We are gonna explore some of these in detail during the presentation. Each of these larger topics are broken into subsections with short descriptions, which we are currently drafting. Eventually, we will take this draft to communities for, uh, for co-creation and for feedback uh, to contribute statements and questions that they want uh, museums to ask and consider. Our monthly meetings have all been held on Zoom, so that's how I've seen <laughs> most of our people. Um, so during our monthly meetings, a handful of themes just kept repeating themselves in our conversations. And over time, we recognized that those themes were really the values that were foundational to the rest of the work. And we realized it would be important to art articulate those values right at the start of the guide. So these shared values will then set the stage for everything discussed throughout the rest of the guide. And every section that follows is basically giving you guidance, right, on how to apply those values to the specific collections management and stewardship work that we're discussing. So we're gonna walk you through the values in a second, but just to let you know, we decided to um, organize these values by kind of phases of understanding rather than by importance. They're all important, absolutely equally important and intimately related, but we agreed it was important strategically to sort of walk somebody through, like first you need to understand this and then you can move on to this concept and then you can move on to this concept, okay? So the first value is to seek pathways to healing through establishing trust and collaboratively developing new practices. Recognize and acknowledge the colonial systems that led to the acquisition of collections and the ongoing practices that continue to affect their access and care. So what we mean by this is that the discomfort on all sides can be an opportunity for education, growth, and restorative justice. Recognition and healing can begin through nurturing relationships on any level. Respectful and meaningful collection stewardship, as suggested in the guide, can be one pathway towards healing. And you can begin by simply choosing to be conscious and aware of the fact that you make choices in collections care, including how you refer to items and spaces, such as housing facility, as opposed to like storage room, and how open you are to welcoming and accommodating commu communities and their guidance. Our second value is to cede authority and shift the power dynamic so that tribes as sovereign nations have power and intellectual primacy over their cultural items. We promote actively seeking respect, uh, to actively seek respect and incorporate appropriate protocols and language from tribes and collections care and access. Establish a baseline of care while one seeks to establish these relationships and individual care needs, which often differ among communities. Prioritize indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing and defining the concept of expert. Acknowledge, invite, and welcome differences in perspective, values, and framework. This includes stories, oral histories, and oral traditions. Um, understand and respect that knowledge and access are privileges, not rights. The next value is to engage in meaningful consultation and collaboration with communities in all aspects of collection stewardship. So consultation is the first step to implementing any form of culturally appropriate care and museum professionals need to, need to be open, educatable and adaptable. And collections reviews can really offer transparency and opportunities to discuss many of the topics throughout this guide. And finally, we wanna encourage people to focus on cultural continuity instead of preservation, okay? Many existing best practices in collection stewardship prioritize Western ways of knowing and caring for collections and items. So the guide will show what collections care looks like when native ways of knowing are prioritized. 
To round out the guide, um, we are proposing a, um, an appendix um, that will uh, that will include resources, templates, and examples, and case studies, um, including references to the guidelines for collaboration and the protocols for archival materials that we discussed. Um, and really the idea is the appendix would help be the toolkit for museum professionals who want to apply the values as they are outlined throughout the guide. So now that we've explained what we're working on, um, the big question is when will it be ready? Um, we still have more work to do. Once we, right, currently we are drafting uh, descriptions for each of the different sections. Um, and so uh, once we have further refined the contents, the organization uh, um, and whatnot, we plan to host a number of content creation and review sessions with community representatives. In these sessions, we plan to discuss the initial section descriptions and overall content and really focus especially on what questions or considerations tribal representatives want museums to ask them as related to each section. This does not include specific care instructions or protocols, only prompts and thoughts to guide needed conversations. These will be the core content of the guide. We recognize that we are not the experts here and that this guide could be a starting point to broader conversations, deeper relationships, and fieldwide change. After we have incorporated the feedback and input from those meetings, we will host two review sessions with museum professionals. These will focus on the accessibility of the language and ideas, not on content development. In addition to these focused meetings, we plan to have an online survey to reach more people for reactions and more general feedback. And then uh, we will give community participants another opportunity to give feedback on the final draft um, before um, all of the final edits are made and we begin dissemination. So this is the timeline as it exists. Um, and we know that funding is needed to support all of these activities. Um, we, uh, we are currently applying for an IMLS National Leadership Grant to be submitted this fall. Um, and so pending funding, the guide should be complete by the fall of 2026. Um, one, the main bulk of the, uh, of the funds that we're requesting for, uh, from the grant um, is really to pay those community representatives for their time and expertise um, in, the, uh, in the content creation of the guide. Okay, so once all this is done, we need to get it out there, right? So we do have a web page on the SAR website for general information about the project, and you can check there for any major updates. We've got these beautiful pieces of paper on your tables uh, to keep you informed and to give you some information as well. Um, and we do plan to continue to share this work uh, through presentations at conferences and at a symposium, hopefully at the end, funding dependent and eventually have workshops and training or teaching materials to get the message out broadly to the museum field, to people who have never thought of doing this before or have the germ of an idea, but don't know how to move forward. So today, what we're gonna do now that we've laid that groundwork and kind of put some context around the rest of the conversation, we're gonna share with you the draft text of several portions of the guide with members of the group who helped write this language up here. Um, this text is going to capture the descriptions within the sections or subsections that Laura was referencing. And these, again, are meant to be orienting to the subject and general considerations, but the true core content will come out of those content creation and review sessions with tribal communities. Um, these descriptions we share with you today are still in draft form and are subject to change, especially, again, in those uh, content review sessions. So group members, again, who have helped craft this language are up here explaining it to you all. All right, um, uh, Pathways of Authority is my section, um, which I was sitting here thinking um, and uh, that really, what does pathways of authority mean? And to me, it's just, it, it means a process of identifying the first contact, the first opportunity to make contact and to do it right with the community that you're reaching out to, whether it's a native nation, a tribe, um, or a different community. It's the very first opportunity that a museum or institution has to make contact with that community. 
Um, so I'll go ahead and read a little bit about what's on the slide. And I have some discombobulated notes up here, half on a piece of paper and half on my phone. So um, bear with me, I'm helping turn a conference. Um, so identifying appropriate decision makers within a community, obviously very essential to the work that you're doing as a museum or institution representative. Um, every community is different. So the way you would go about finding the appropriate authority at the, um, or within the community tribe nation that you're working with um, will look different for every situation, right? Um, and um, this approach that we've identified at the ICC is really um, respects tribal sovereignty and places that at the top, we'll take the lead from, from the communities we're working with. Um, so because this is really the first opportunity that um, an individual would have to make contact with the community, like I said, to me, it's it's really an incredible time. And I think sometimes museums and institutions get this part wrong. There's a lot of anxiety. Who do I contact? How do I contact? What if they don't respond? How do I do this? How do I do that, right? Um, and I think I think if, if we were to just like take a second to slow the process down and think to ourselves, like what do we want to get out of these interactions and why is this important for the work, right? And how, um, so so how do you approach a community? Uh, and how do you find out the person who's going to be the lead contact for you through the work? Well, um, I, like I said, I want to say that no size fits all, right? We are we are 574 federally recognized tribes and over 300 other Native nations who may or may not have state recognition and local recognition. There is no size fits all, right? Um, and every, every Native nation and tribe has... Um, sometimes traditional protocols that will identify an appropriate authority. Sometimes the native nation or tribe or community has governmental protocols in place. Um, and so um, that's not helpful, right? That's not answering the question, but um, that that is in fact the landscape that no size fits all, right? And so a couple of places that you can start and a couple of suggestions I have as someone who, who um, has been in this field a long time and someone who works uh, very closely with uh, Native Nations you know, on the ground level. Um, I can give you some suggestions. We've created some as a group um, through discussions um, with, with a lot of uh, people present who have expertise and who represent um, indigenous communities. And so a couple of places you can start the obvious, right? You guys in this room know these things, right? Um, most of you, but, you know, looking at the chairperson or the, you know, the, the president, the governors of the, the, the highest leader of, of Native nations or tribes, there's also, you know, tribal historic preservation offices, right? You have language departments, cultural centers, museums. Those are usually the first places that you want to look a lot of times the way that um, uh, this uh, work kind of goes at the tribal level. A lot of the people who are doing um, that level of work, tribal museum work, repatriation, neg, for all of that, um, you'll find those names and who those people are by reaching out um, to tribal museums or language programs um, and the, the highest official at the tribe. But um, I also want to go a little deeper into some suggestions that I have as someone who is on the receiving end of those phone calls or those letters for many, many years. Uh, I think that it's important because this is the first opportunity to make contact that that you take the time, right, as, as museum officials and institutions, pick up the phone, right, make the phone call, <laughs> uh, talk to the people that you're going to be working with. Um, go to the tribal websites, go to where there's resources that the community has published, um, because what's important to that community will be on their websites, right, will be in those, those printed materials. What's important to that community um, should be important to you, right, um, as, especially as it relates to the work that you're doing. Um, and, and one thing that I think is always a bad practice um, and I will die on this hill, is that sending a letter without making contact first is, is not a good move. <laughs> um, and so my, my suggestion is not only to 
find out what's important to that community, um, making phone calls, but perhaps you would want to set up a meeting, an in-person face-to-face meeting first before you would go ahead and send a letter, right? Um, you would want to make contact with that community. Perhaps you'd want to find out how to approach that community in its own traditional way. Um, and that can be done during that phone call, right? But if you have, if you don't put in the time and the effort and, and, and then you know you don't build that relationship, and I think that pathways of authority is really, uh, I, I don't particularly love the word authority. And I know um, there's a lot of tribal uh, and, and Native Nations uh, representatives out there who probably also feel the same way. Um, but for the context of, of how we, we've we um, talked about this, you know, it is about relationship building. This part of the process, pathways of authority is relationship building. Um, and so if I if I wrap my mind around it that way, instead of looking at that word, you know, authority, um, this is an incredible opportunity. And because of that, you know, like I said, tribes have different protocols for these things, right? Could be more of a traditional protocol that identifies representatives. It could be traditional knowledge carriers who understand the context of the items or the collections that you have. It could be language speakers because some of our speakers are the ones who hold that gift to unlocking some of those items that have been stored in our museum or in museums and, and institutions. It could be that um, the, the tribe has identified, um, you know, a, a designee who's also a staff member in some department somewhere across the tribe. It could be that the tribe has identified a delegation that they send. Just like we've seen with the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi, they have a traditions and repatriation committee that's led by community elders who have knowledge, who have teachings, who, who guide this work. And so it does look different in every community. And that's why it's so important to take those, those extra moments to really try to build that relationship before you approach the community. And because... Um, I, I'm sure that most of you know there's a lot of turnover um, at institutions, museums, and at the tribal level. And so this process, um, you might think you're, you've built that relationship and then you'll have to start it over, right? And so this is a continuous process of identifying who, who is the lead contact for you um, and, and continuing to build that relationship. Um, and because this is the first contact, this person who you do make contact with will likely be the person who will inform you about care and treatment going forward. And so um, I cannot stress enough how important it is to take the time to find out what's important to the community that you wish to work with, to do that in a good way, to find um, you know, the maybe it's making if it's making phone calls, you might get the wrong person, right? You might get the wrong office. You might get transferred around and around and around um, until you get the right person. But all through that process, that's also engaging. That's also you reaching out. That's also you putting in the work, right? Um, and I, I had one final note, but I guess I lost it in, in the midst of things. But I oh no, nope, I don't know. Well, if it, if it comes to me, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll shoot up and raise my hand. But um, yeah, I just think that this this process is so important and and one that often does uh, go go wrong when you're trying to identify. Um, there's also a couple other resources I wanted to say in addition to reaching out to um, the the highest official, right, or the tribal museums, language programs, your cultural repatriation specialists, NAGPRA. Um, whatever those titles might be at the tribal level. Um, there's also other some other resources that you might tap into. I know that like um, some different organizations have lists, right? NAFPO has a, 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 a TIPO list. Um, I Melanie can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Melanie uh, National NAGPRA has a, a contact list for NAGPRA officials. There are other places that you can look for this information. And like I said, because of high turnover rate, you might get the wrong contact. But if you're making... The out, if you're doing the outreach um, and you're making contact that's still engaging in the community, you're still meeting people over the phone and still putting in the work and that will be recognized, I think, and helpful in your relationship building moving forward. So um, with that, I will um, uh, acquiesce it over to the next speaker. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Mia. So part of everyday collection care is how ancestors and cultural items are physically handled and how they are housed. As collection managers and museum professionals, we spend a lot of time in the collection itself. 
And each Indigenous community may have a different set of standards as to who can handle or be in the presence of an ancestor or cultural item where they should be housed and how they are housed. And in all instances, it's critical to speak with the community and find out about their preferences and then work together to integrate those preferences into your everyday collection care. And before I continue, I just want to make a note that the photos that are used in this section are general collection care photos rather than photos of any of the material I'm going to speak about that have been rehoused using protocols that were established through consultation. Um, it wasn't um, considered appropriate by me um, or my partners to share photo examples of items that we have rehoused at the State Museum. So each indigenous group, like we've been saying, may have their own individual standards for physical handling. There is no one size fits all, and that's why we ask. Um, that can include who is allowed to handle the item or ancestors and under what, um, under what conditions. These handling standards may require additional planning, training, and preparation. So you need to be prepared to dedicate your time to listen, to adapt, so for example, at the State Museum, we've worked with a tribal partner recently to rehouse an item that can be handled by women, but should not be handled by a woman during her menstrual cycle. So that does require extra planning, making sure that we're aware as staff to that protocol and planning around it. And more recently with a different tribal partner, I was asked to rehouse objects of cultural patrimony in preparation for repatriation. That tribal representative that I was working with specifically asked that after those items were rehoused, that they are not handled or accessed by anyone, and that includes me, until the tribe is ready to have those items physically transferred. Where an item or an ancestor is physically placed in a room can also be significant. That includes can include proximity to other ancestors or cultural items or the direction that the ancestor or the item is facing. At the State Museum, we've implemented this in two recent cases. In one case, our tribal partner asked that the item of concern be completely separated from any other material. They did not want it close to any of their own cultural material or anybody else's cultural material. And so we were able to accommodate this request by completely clearing out a cabinet and only that item is now housed in that cabinet. And in the second case, our tribal partner asked that all of the items be placed together in the same box so that they could be in close proximity with each other. And this was done by creating a custom box that would fit all of the relevant items together as one. We also must take into consideration our language. It's important to be respectful when we're naming our spaces within a collection facility and to avoid culturally insensitive terms. So for instance, at the State Museum, we don't name our collection rooms after donors. We do not name them after any of our previous um, collectors or after the material that are in those rooms. Instead, we refer to them by their assigned building number. So the largest room that I manage is W514. And that is how it is referred to in our everyday language. Housing materials also has to be taken into consideration. Some standard archival housing that we're used to using that we've been told is our standard as museum professionals may be more appropriate than others for indigenous ancestors or cultural items, depending on the context. For example, an indigenous community may ask that a certain cultural item is housed in a clear box rather than an opaque blue board box like many of us are so used to using so that the item can be able to see out of the container. There are other examples where um, groups have asked for, uh, for containers to be breathable. And so you need to consult on what that breathable material is. At the State Museum, we've had more than one request from tribal partners to wrap items in red cloth. Typically, we wouldn't wrap items in red cloth. There's a risk of dye transfer or that the item, that the red cloth might not be archival and it may off gas and harm the item in question. But in discussing these risks with our tribal partners, each of those groups decided that it would be appropriate to have a layer of archival tissue paper between the item and the red cloth as a buffer. And so we were able to meet in the middle. But it's important for collection practitioners to be flexible in those requests and remember that tribal nations are the ones who know how to care for their cultural belongings and you have to put what they say first because you do not know better than them. Collection professionals also rely on item identification numbers for associating items with documentation. 
what may be considered best labeling practices from a museum perspective may be considered invasive or disrespectful by an indigenous community and alternate ways of labeling may be recommended. So as museum professionals, we're pretty used to historically having labels directly adhered to objects. Sometimes that's irreversible. And we've in the past written numbers directly on items using archival pens. And instead, it is important to consider maybe an easily removable tag, something that's not permanent. And if you are adhering a label that you use a method that is reversible. The way we label containers, shelves, and rooms is also important. Container labels should use appropriate and respectful terminology. And containers that hold items with specific care, handling, or access instructions should have those instructions clearly labeled on the container. For example, I mentioned earlier that a tribal partner requested that a set of items not be handled by anyone, including myself, until they could be repatriated. After those items were rehoused, according to the tribe standards, the box was clearly labeled as not to be handled so that anyone else working in, this, in the collection room will know and that I myself will not forget those instructions. Shelving aisles and rooms can also be labeled to indicate that they hold sensitive items or that they have access restrictions. And again, as I'm closing, I want to emphasize that, as Colleen said, there is no one size fit all standard. The way to discover the preferences of the Indigenous communities whose materials you're stewarding is to ask them questions, to listen, and then to take what they say seriously and to prioritize those standards, even if it's something that flies in the face of what you've been taught as a museum professional. So in the same way that handling and housing practices are becoming more inclusive of culturally appropriate care, uh, so too is our approach to records, catalogs, and databases that house the information about uh, and images of cultural items. The ICC guide includes a section on item records and catalog entries, which will address issues of access, language choices, cataloging standards, and corrections and additions to records. So the section on access addresses the fundamental co connection between access and authority. So while we understand that catalog records need to be accessed on a regular basis by museum staff for collections care and management responsibility, we also know that not all staff require equal levels of access. The guide will provide recommendations and questions to consider when developing both internal and external policies and procedures focused on access. Questions may include, but aren't limited to, who has access to records, what records or parts of records should be and should not be accessible, what should and should not be documented in records, and who gets to decide. The language used in catalog records, both past and present, uh, and the constraints of the standard museum nomenclature systems that we use are topics that we've all given a lot of talk to during our monthly meetings. In the guide, we advocate for the addition of indigenous ontologies, epistemologies, and taxonomies to catalog records, and that the request to share such knowledge be made respectfully and acknowledge from whom those additions were made and when. The way catalog records describe an object it immediately sets a tone for how an institution perceives its authority. A simple shift to use of a community's name for an item as the primary name versus being the alternative name can be really powerful. What happens if we flip the script and the standard museum nomenclature becomes the alternative name? So again, what the guide is advocating for really goes beyond sharing authority to privileging indigenous knowledge and language choices. Standardized nomenclature systems are a direct reflection of the history of museums. This is a history focused on documentation, authority, and control. These nomenclature systems privilege Western colonial knowledge and frequently silence indigenous perspectives. The ICC guide seeks to normalize inclusive and collaborative knowledge production and will raise awareness of post-colonial database platforms like Mercatu, which was built with indigenous communities to manage and share digital cultural heritage and local contexts, which uh, was mentioned previously, um, which involved indigenous folks in uh, data systems and their development. They were the creators of the uh, traditional knowledge or TK knowledge, which some of you may be 
familiar with. As with other sections of this guide, consultation is essential. Museums should ask communities their preferred language and how and where they would like to see it used. And finally, this section addresses one of the many positive outcomes of Indigenous collections care practices, corrections and additions to historical or legacy data, which we all know oftentimes can be offensive, outdated, inappropriate, or culturally insensitive, or just simply incorrect. Through consultation and collections reviews, new information can be added and legacy data corrected or removed. Any changes made to records should be reviewed and approved to ensure accuracy and potential access restrictions. When we acknowledge that indigenous communities are the experts and we make space for new knowledge and perspectives to be incorporated into records, um, hopefully this will have a ripple effect to all other facets of museum operations. So as previously mentioned, this work goes beyond NAGPRA. The primary importance is to connect communities to their heritage that will be continually uh, held in museums and other institutions. To create a pathway for communities to unite and engage with collections within or beyond the institutional setting. These connections bring life to both the collection and the community. The space manifests in this interaction that opens the door to stories and memories. And, and an ex excellent example is the Pacific Collections Access Project at the Auckland Museum in New Zealand. So communities are authorities in their material culture from gathering and preparing material to creating and utilizing items within their traditional practices. Objects in museums are living, visible, intangible expressions connecting identity and continuity from the past to the present and into the future. We encourage museums to open that door, to bring communities in, to provide a space that awakens the intangible cultural heritage that is embedded in the physical form of items. The heirloom dresses worn by these girls represent a continuity of practice that also brings the ancestors of the past to the present through their connection to the dresses via stories, memories, histories, and knowledge. Museums hold community treasures that need to be energized by connecting them to their descendant communities. In engaging with community, museums can learn not only the appropriate use of the items, but also the needs of an item. It is important for museums to not only be open about the condition of items, but also to learn from the community about what are appropriate uses and needs. Communities have responsibility to items held by museums. Those responsibilities are tangible and intangible that goes beyond ownership and represents caretaking of those in the past and, and the present. It behooves a museum to be culturally sensitive to the needs of communities and the objects under their care, to open the door, to be prepared, to be aware of the mood, to provide what is needed in a particular moment. This bell is one of several ways that I have prepared for traditional spiritual care in the collection that I steward. Through the years of listening and observing, I felt it was important to have one in the repository should the need arise. It wasn't something I consciously said I was gonna go out and buy a bell. The bell showed itself to me, the idea came to my mind, I purchased it, uh, purchased a bag for it, and I put it and keep it in my office in case it is needed. And this year, for the first time, probably after three or four years, it was used. Um, I had researchers coming in to look at a federal archaeological collection from an old Wanapum village site that we curate under, the, under a memorandum of understanding. And we are in a time of transition with the passing of an elder and the next generation taking on unaccustomed responsibilities in a museum. I already knew the importance of the place and could sense his concern and unease and asked if he would like to have a ceremony, shared that I have had a bell if he needed one and indicated that my staff could stay or leave um, what was um, preferred. And we had the ceremony, we all participated and um, including an elder who was in the building. Next. So museums should not continue to marginalize descendant communities from their heritage. These holdings, um, those holding collection, cultural collection should honor indigenous rights and give voice to their need to connect with and care for their cultural items. Communities have responsibilities to protect and perpetuate their cultural heritage. 
These collections are touchstones for communities and are embedded with knowledge. Museums should open the door for engagement and give voice to the obligations of the communities and collections. The relationship will be fluid and needs will shift with this intersection of the tangible and intangible. Museums will need to be flexible as they listen and learn from descendant communities to prioritize and give deference to their knowledge and perspectives. Museums should not only decolonize decolonize their practice, but indigenize it through collaboration and engagement. And my hope is that change can be made that celebrates the diverse perspectives that indigenous communities can bring to the table. So my um, comments are from an outsider perspective. Professionally, I'm a bioanthropologist and an osteologist with little museum experience, which qualifies me for the outside perspective, I think. So listening to the presentations, reviewing what's been written by the indigenous working groups, um, working group, I, I really began to see real parallels, um, a parallel path between how I do NAGPRA and how the indigenous um, collections care working group is creating a really a pathway to change the museum profession. So for an example, over uh, so for over 15 years, the Columbia Plateau Tribes and Central Washington University really created a visible, open, participatory NAGPRA process. Um, the tribes are at the table from the inventory to cultural affiliation. I don't do anything by myself. Um, making our work visible results in a really practical, positive, proactive indigenous methods and relationships. The ICC guidelines create relationships between communities and museums and between objects or items, possessions, it's so awkward um, finding the words, and the museums. Um, these relationships really are built uh, out of mutual trust and, and really accepting um, mutual expertise. Um, if you listen, and you hear, um, you begin to really un maybe start to understand um, that possessions are living. And so they talk about this in this document. Um, they reflect cultural practices. Um, the stories um, are told um, and as these um, items awaken and, 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 and we as outsiders, um, we really have to hear what is being said. My experience really, the first time this ever happened with me um, was listening to um, some the older women and, uh, and how, which I never ever thought of with baskets and baskets are sisters. Um, and, and them saying how I should be treating them and how I should interact with them. And when you create a relationship with a basket, you actually never interact with the basket the same again. And, and that's what I see the ICC is really trying to get out to the rest of us. You know, practicing a very visible indigenous driven process changes you for, for an outsider, for a museum official, for a NAGPRA worker. Um, the way we do NAGPRA at CW uh, really fundamentally changed me, and that came from the push from the tribes, not from me in the beginning. It changes you personally, it changes you professionally. You just never can do or be the same. Um, and, and this is what I see this, this working group hoping as an outcome from this work. Um, the ICC guidelines emphasize this community engagement. Um, that, and so I'm going to tell you a little quick two-part story, and you are very welcome to laugh at me um, at what the first part here. So um, the first part is an example of what happens when you have no tribal input. So this is, I call the snowshoe part one. So we're looking at our image here. In 1954, um, objects 
similar to what you see up here, was donated to Central Washington University. And the paperwork describes it as a snowshoe. Okay. In 2013, a lot of years later, a, Wanapum, a representative from the Wanapum Band of Priest Rapids saw a picture of the object and heard our description and pointed out that this is not a snowshoe. And I, of course, wanted to engage and show my thinking, and I do think, and a little bit maybe here, and I agreed with them because the person would have had to have very small feet if this was a snowshoe. Well, raised eyebrows, a lot of laughter. Um, this is a net sinker. It's not a snowshoe. Um, and so it brings me to what the um, ICC is trying to do or suggesting we do. Um, is this um, engagement part two? And so this is when you flip the perspective, you change what you've been doing, you make the visible, invisible visible. And as we see that through engagement, the Wanapum Band of Priest Rap becomes the center. And from their knowledge, four other museums became involved and a net sinker or what was thought to be a very rare or maybe one in the case that was the Smithsonian um, had, turned out there were several other museums who had the same object. So when you engage, you really bring out and transform um, what you can learn. So this is my uh, kind of inspiring, empowering, and uh, inspiring, becoming, empowering, a little Michelle Obama stealing here. Um, the ICC working group presentation and, and reading through all the work they have done really is inspirational. Um, and it really is inspiring all of us to change, um, whether you are an insider or an outsider. And it really creates some real pathways. It doesn't leave you floundering, which sometimes can happen. And it tells us to center these indigenous communities. That's what we want to do. Um, but it, it can, when we might think with museum professionals, we kind of had, kind of had this discussion. It's like, you're just not working by yourself. You, you, you're, you, you, can, move, you can go out and, and for me or for them, if you're teaching, it really changes how you teach. Um, you, you, you bring a whole different um, attitude, ideas, perspective into the classroom. It, for me, it's really um, this open process has really um, been a way to engage my other faculty. So everyone in my department follows this very open. You start with the tribes whenever you start to do something. Um, it is makes change something very welcome when you open that door. Um, I sometimes now say that the door, you know, we, I began saying, well, we invite, invited the tribes in and one day the light bulb goes off and I realize, well, it is really the tribes who are inviting me. You know, I'm not there if they don't want me in there. And so it really goes back to flipping that perspective. And that's what I see um, this group really starting and trying to do. Um, and so I'm going to leave you with a really, in, in, in the spirit of a very good heart for many of you, um, and I actually wish you a snowshoe moment um, because um, you only have that kind of moment if you take these suggestions um, from this um, working group and you engage with community. If you sit by yourself, like, well, what was what I did for you know my way I was trained, you're never going to say something in many ways quite stupid. Um, but that is really how we um, we really begin to change. So thank you. And thank you for allowing me to participate. Mm -hmm. So big thank you to all the panelists. And we also wanted to take the opportunity. This is not the, the only members of our working group. We wanted to really uh, like thank everyone who regularly participates in our monthly meetings on this and um, has really contributed a lot 
um, to our process. So a big thank you to all of the group. Um, and at this time, I thought we could uh, take any questions um, and comments, anything. And uh, and then on your on your tables, there should be a um, a small piece of paper with a QR code. Um, and and so if you are able and and willing, um, that takes you to a survey that just kind of helps us better understand the needs um, and uh, the the needs of the museum field and of communities um, for this type of guide and helps us in its creation um, and hopefully uh, hopefully also in its funding. So please take the time to do that. We really, really appreciate your time and support. And um, Marla and I are also at the end during lunch, we're gonna be um, kind of perched somewhere. We did bring uh, copies of the current draft that we have of some of the language. Um, and so if you're interested in learning more or talking with us or seeing any of that, please come find us. We're happy to share some of that with you. We want, um, we really want this to be uh, a collaborative project, so. Questions? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning. My name is Roshan Downs. And I have a question. When I looked at your list of the items that you guys had and the processes, I didn't see um, repatriation and return of the ancestors on that list. I seen care, I seen displays, I seen all of that, but I didn't see anything that made returning those ancestors. Um, a priority. So maybe you can help correct me on that. Absolutely. And that's one thing we want to make uh, make clear that the guide fits into the niche of collections care stewardship, right? There are a bunch of wonderful resources like AIA, like National NAGPRA, like the community of practice that already address a lot of the repatriation needs. So there will be pointers in the guide to all of those resources. We're not gonna just leave a blank hole for that topic, <clears throat> but we are going to kind of point everywhere, everybody kind of to those other existing resources. Similarly, we're not addressing exhibitions or education needs. Our experience and the people up here uh, on the panel, we are collections care kind of specialists in the museum field. And so that's where our expertise lies. And that's the conversations that we feel comfortable shaping. There is room for people to talk about exhibitions. There's room for people to talk about um, educational programming. And one of the positions we're taking is that if you start with collections care, if you change that language and that catalog record, it's going to have a ripple effect because that's what a curator is now going to see when they look and they're pulling things for an exhibition. That's what an educator will see when they look and try to identify things for class uses. So the guide does touch on repatriation and talks about um, needs for NAGPRA related documentation, how that needs to be kind of cared for, uh, but we're not going to go deep into it at all. So one of the things that we're planning to include kind of in some of the introductory statements is really that um, this is adjacent to repatriation and that repatriation is the number one priority and that a lot of these care protocols happen in that in the repatriation conversation um, and are meant to serve as um, uh, basically a bridge until things are able to return home. Um, and then also thinking about um, items that are outside of NAGPRA um, or um, or that the community wants to leave in the in the hands of the institution and have a relationship in that way. And so um, it's trying to capture more than just the conversation of repatriation. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, however, those collections are not separate. You know, right. when you separate them all, things get separated, things don't get returned. That's not my department, that's not what I do. Um, and it takes a link out of the circle. And those care of those items and not making repatriation the priority, you're separating the care as though it's an object. That object has life and the object has a place to go. Rather it's a clear container, a wooden box, 
red mm -hmm. um, material that you're afraid it's the dye is going to create archival issues. The ultimate goal would be those collections go to the people and the people come and tell you and you know and when they come for those care that care of those items and they tell you how to care for it you most likely are not going to be able to care for the items the way that the tribal people and the ultimate goal would be that so just a suggestion that separating those maybe may work in the museum world but it doesn't work in the tribal world thank you no that's, thank you that's hard and taken thank you mm -hmm. Annie Beaujou. I'm David Michener, curator of the University of Michigan Botanical Gardens, ninth generation colonizer settler, 40 years in botanic gardens, and 20 years on the graduate faculty steering committee of the 18 museums of the University of Michigan. Mine is a follow up in many ways to the immediate question just posed. I'll put it in a different language. In gardens, we know we are only stewards, that nothing is forever. All things return to earth. When I look at the language here on the outline, it is still the colonial idea that we are going to preserve forever. It is one of objects rather than of kin. And when will we start as museum professionals referring to the kin? We heard it with the baskets. The unspoken ones here are the seeds and the plants across almost every tier one university and many museums of this country, which also need to be rematriated. Also in this framework, they're all kin. And I look at this language and I hear a tension between my culture wanting eternal control as opposed to the quote I heard, to provide what is needed and what is needed is going home. How do you put that message first? Thank you. <laughs> I think it's important to make clear that a prime audience for this guide are museum professionals who, for the final product, are museum professionals who live firmly in that colonial world with that idea of preservation and static in mind. So we did craft some of the language to make it accessible to them as sort of like a, an index so they can look at for a term that they're a little bit more familiar with and then read the section that we've written, which hopefully, and we'll go back and look at our language after your guys' reactions, of course, uh, that language will hopefully tell them there's another way to think about that topic that they are familiar with, right? So for conservation, we didn't address the text for that here in this presentation, but we talk about in the guide that it's important to have, um, members of the community perform the conservation if possible, or to allow it to deteriorate if that's what they tell you it needs to do. That language is in there and we're introduce, we're hoping to introduce these thoughts to people who have no idea what they're doing. And so what we're writing now is those big kind of introduction grounding texts. And then we're going to create the more specifics of uh, what you should think about when you're talking about these topics when we meet with our tribal um, review sessions. And so this is half, this is half done and it is still as a draft. Um, and it's gonna be a tool hopefully for everybody in the museum field, whether they're doing repatriation or not. Personally, I agree with you. Repatriation is of prime importance, but we need to sort of meet people where they are on some level. Uh, that said, we do very much understand and advocate for these items going home, and want and want repatriation to be um, to 
to be what comes first. And that's that's the initial conversation. Um, this, is, this isn't meant to replace repatriation in any way. Um, it's just meant to kind of help guide a relationship whenever repatriation isn't necessarily a, of interest to some communities, or they want to have a different kind of um, collaborative relationship of care and or bridging that bridging the gap to the return home. And so it is meant to be um, in easy conversation with repatriation. Thank you. I hear the language of bridge. Let us not forget bridges go to the other shore. I think I just want to add one one comment thought on the subject and I think reflecting on this, it's it's making me realize that um, perhaps the first value um, that accompanies this guide should be that repatriation is the ultimate goal, to just put that first, um, recognizing that it takes time. And while that process is taking place, there are things that we can do to make those cultural items more comfortable until they're able to return home. And as they said, in instances where that's not an option or not a priority for whatever reason, um, and recognizing too that we're dealing with um, cultural items that are very diverse, often worldwide in scope. Um, so repatriation isn't always a, a formal process, a legal process. Um, of course, museums can repatriate outside of the law, which is important to remind ourselves of. Um, so I think that's a, an excellent suggestion and I appreciate that being brought forward. We have a, a series of questions from Zoom. The first one is, can we join the monthly meeting? Um, yes, so for uh, in the survey, there's a section at the end where you can um, uh, send us your um, send us your email if you're interested in participating. Um, our contact information is also up here. Definitely reach out to us um, and and let us know. Okay. We also have, can you oh, sorry. Can the presenters speak about how the cons consultants that you work with are compensated for their time and knowledge? How have the institutions that you work for gone about finding and providing funding for that? And along with that, um, what is the proper compensation for this work? Yeah, so um, at this time, whenever we initially started this project, um, it was very informal. Um, and both of us were um, it, even still today are kind of doing this um, adjacent to our normal jobs. And so because we haven't had a, um, a set uh, a project up until this point, um, we everyone has been very generous with their uh, with their time um, and their expertise in con contributing to this project up until this point. Um, we've recently partnered with the uh, School for Advanced Research and applying for this IMLS National Leadership Grant, and so through that funding, we plan to uh, compensate all um, like the working group as well as all community representatives um, and museum partners who join us um, in these content creation and review sessions and vetting sessions throughout. Okay, and then we have another question that I'm gonna unmute and let, the, let Randy ask you directly. Oh. Honka y Jaja Wawitate, Tenuda, Wahe Jaja Wawitate, Randy Tibo, Egiche Kauda Kaonia. I said, uh, Good morning. Uh, my Ponka name is Tenuda, uh, which means Buffalo Warrior. Uh, my taxpayer name is Randy Tibo. I said, uh, Good morning. How are you guys today? Um, <clears throat> I just wanted uh, to. Um, take a minute here and you know we come up with guidelines we come up with laws we come up with these things that that you know to me in a sense is how we're going to handle the Indians you know and I know that's not what you guys are doing but that's that's the way it seems because is this a, a deal that's going to affect every tribal nation 
is this a deal that's going to affect um, every museum and, and, and how they do things? Because it's, you know, in a sense to me, and maybe I'm, and I'm wrong, and, and if I am, I apologize. That it's, this is how we're going to deal with you guys on these certain, certain things and how, you know, the protocol is going to be. You know, I, I, I'm a member of the, the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, I'm also Ponca, Lakota, Rosebud Sioux. Um, I've had experiences with working with, uh, you know, Go Nebraska. I, I had experience working with Lincoln, you know, in the museum and, and, and all the, the folks there is, uh, you know, the thing that, that, that bothers me is, is how are the staff reacting to these certain things? You know, how, you know, we put these guidelines in the places, you know, this is how we're going to deal with the, the Indians, you know, and, you know, how is the staff going to look at that? Um, an example, there was a, a, a Buffalo war bundle that was at, at, at a place. That war bundle was opened by staff and was passed around for folks to be able to look at and, and to study and to things of that nature, which that war bundle should have never been opened by anybody other than person that made that. So, you know, you come up with guidelines you know, for these certain things and how we're going to treat everything and, and look at, but where are the guidelines for the staff? And, you know, are there going to be guidelines drafted that should be for a whole instead of just, you know, individual bases, you know, and, and I hope that made sense to, you know, how we're going to move forward with this and, and, and how we're going to look at it, you know, because every tribe is unique and every tribe is different and every tribe is, you know, this is what I want. This is, you know, I mean, even with federal agencies, you know, I, I've been <clears throat> places where the tribal elders came and wrapped everything up, blessed it, you know, and then they took it back to the museum and they undid everything. They unwrapped everything, put them back in the boxes the way they, 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 they took them out there. You know, so these things are, you know, are things that need to be addressed as well as far as, you know, how we're dealing with each individual museum and agency as well. So thank you for the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Laura, jump in at any point if you need to. My initial reaction to that is the situation that you're describing is kind of exactly what we hope people being familiar with the concepts in the guide will avoid doing. Because hopefully they will have seen that there are special needs for handling and for housing. And maybe they'll say, oh, well, I shouldn't touch this until I talk to people. Um, because that, as you're indicating, that doesn't occur to most people. Museum professionals in collections, you know, we're charged with caring for these items, tracking them, being aware of where they are, putting into a catalog record, et cetera. Um, and you sometimes need that extra outside voice to say like, hang on a minute, you don't need to open that up and touch every single thing inside of it in order to catalog its, its existence. The fact that the bundle is there is enough, the end. You don't need to open that up. But for a lot of collections care professionals, they don't, they don't think that way and they need to be told to think that way. And we're hoping that the language in the guide can help them think that way. Um, and expose them to the fact that that's and that's something that they need to consider and reach out and have those communications. Um, that said, the guide is not meant to give those specific protocols um, to where it will offer some of those suggestions of um, th things in general to consider, um, but knowing that Every time we started drafting a section, it was always, well, you need to consult on this. Well, you need to consult on this. And so that is a reoccurring theme um, throughout the entire guide. So it's not saying for this particular item, for this particular tribe, this is what you need to do, um, because you really have to talk with the community about that. And those ideas sometimes change over time. And so um, you have to continue those relationships. And so that's kind of the, um, that, that's one of the key points that we try to, that we're trying to emphasize within the language. And we hope that people will see this as a, a tool for advocacy, to advocate within their institution, that these are a set of um, ideas and, and guidelines that they should listen to. If you start making changes on a small level in the collections care, hopefully it will ripple out 
to the larger institution. As somebody said earlier, it took decades for us to get into these fraught relationships and it's gonna take decades for us to get out of them. But it doesn't mean you can't try, you can't start, you can't do something small, even if it's just asking how you should care for something on a shelf. Questions? And if I can add, just getting things started even in one collection is something that we're hoping will ripple out because everybody looks to the anthropology collection and says, okay, well, you're the only one who has to do this work. And that's not true. We have paleontologists, we have zoologists, botany, parasitology, all of those things that are collected, they come from somewhere and they come from someone else's land. And so we're starting with the things that are familiar, but it doesn't have to stay there. So this isn't something that will just ripple out to exhibits and education staff. It's hopefully going to ripple out to other collections so that they see they're not exempt just because they don't have what they would call a quote unquote cultural item or an ancestor that it applies to everyone. And so other collections other than those historical anthropological or art collections, hopefully we'll be learning these same kind of concepts. There's two questions. We got a couple of questions here. Um, so following that up, I think I hear the diff or this guide as a form of advocacy. And I think with advocacy, accountability needs to be mm -hmm. a part of it. So mm -hmm. I know that you can't include everything in a guide and every institution has different policies, practices. I'm coming from the University of Michigan. Um, and so is there an opportunity for this to be scaffolded or included within this of how do you keep institutions accountable, not tribal communities, not native mm -hmm. communities, but institutions accountable when protocols are broken, when the guide is not necessarily being followed? Um, and this is something that I experience in my field as a diversity, equity, inclusion expert, that hearing not all staff need equal access, and the other part of it that collection rooms are not named after donors, right? So small things like that are everyday vernacular. And then when it time when the time comes to implement the guide, the guide is welcome, people are excited, but then folks who want to advocate then don't have, I don't want to say the knowledge, but aren't feeling safe about tapping into their colleague that is being really problematic and saying harmful stuff. Like, is there an opportunity for the group to think about accountability and like really embedding that within there when we think about not only like staff accountability, but institutional accountability, the university a name has a plethora, all buildings are named after really harmful and horrible people. And so when we think about the collections that are in the spaces, it comes with a lot not just within the collections, but just the buildings themselves. So I don't know if that made sense, but I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that's something that we've talked a lot about as a group. And um, one of the ways that we see uh, as an opportunity for hold, having that accountability is for institutions to ingrain it within their policies and their procedures, which then holds the institution accountable within their own, um, within the board, that sort of thing. This group itself does not have the power of a law to have any kind of um, like financial impact that I know often kind of drives that accountability, um, but it is something that I think is important. And with the um, hopeful passing of the regulations eventually, um, there's the duty of care that's incorporated in that. And so kind of bringing some of these ideas and this language into the duty of care really adds some teeth to it um, by having the NACPA law. So I recognize that you don't have like the financial and legal background, but you have the institutional background. So if you can write something in an accountability that an institution, you know, a suggestion can be that the institution faces some type of financial impact. So like, I think having that in a document allows communities to then point to something mm -hmm. where you might not have that legal um, power, 
But then because of the name of the association and NAGPRA, then there's something written, right? Because a lot of these dominant systems require that things are written, right? When we think of law. And so how can you use what you're doing to make sure that there's something to point back to, even if you cannot have that, but it gives someone else, like it's leveraging that power, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you. Yeah, no. <laughs> So just one very quick comment. I know there's lots of questions, but I think one of the goals here is changing normative practice. So what once was acceptable no longer is acceptable and ensuring that that is ingrained into the practices that we learn in our education and that that then becomes reflected in institutional policy and those policies and procedures are documents that are used for museums to get accredited. So this all sort of trickles mm -hmm. out. Um, so potentially it could be a, a threat of loss of accreditation or not being an accredible institution. And those are things that hurt purse strings in the way you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Hello, Frank Hedowardishik here, and uh, you know I, I'm uh, this whole guide and uh, this whole process is dealing in that intersection between the the indigenous communities and the, and the institutions, and in that process, uh, so often it happens for us is that this process is coming towards the communities. And I think that it was pointed out, I think the snowshoe story was a great story, okay? That, that there, for many years ago, I read a book called Not for Innocent Ears. Uh, many, some of you may know of this book and it was about someone studying with the tribe. And after many years of studying, they told this person something. And she said, well, why didn't you tell me that in the first place? Makes so much sense. And the woman, the elder who was telling her said, because what I had to say was not for innocent ears. We had to train your ears before you could hear what we have to say. In other words, there's so much stuff that we have, but in this, this idea of consultation, it's also developing the relationship. It's not just mm -hmm. consulting somehow one-on-one -on -one with language out here that anybody could study. Mm -hmm. It's actually building that relationship. It's as you said, building a relationship with the basket, I was really touched by the way you talked about that. But that whole thing is this idea that, that as that the indigenous knowledge that we have about these things, we may not be able to tell you everything about something. Mm -hmm. We may not be able to reveal all of that. We may be able to just like a stone skipping over the water, touch you, tell you a little bit about it enough to, to get going in because the information is so deep and so complex that institutionally, the institution might not be able to get it. Eventually, individuals may develop that, that relationship to where they can get it. But uh, we know that, that individuals make up the institutions, but the institutions often establish things that drive people nuts. We all talk about the bureaucracy out there and what that does, academia being one of those huge bureaucracies. And so we understand that. But I wanted to just talk about this briefly and see if you had comments about this idea that the now it's, it's a two-way street here. It isn't just one way. And for indigenous people, the depth of our knowledge about the objects that you may have, about what they mean, as the people talked about, separating them from the, the remains of, in a, as funerary objects or whatever. Yeah, this whole concept is something that we have, we have to be careful how we communicate. Because even if we tell you some things, if your ears aren't trained, you're not gonna be able to even hear it. So we have to be careful. We have to work together. And it's, it's, it's this collaboration process mm -hmm. that's important. And I really appreciate what's going on with what I've seen in the panel presentation and what you're all working on, working towards. But I wanted to make this observation that it is uh, it is something that's ongoing. Our elders over here in Clarence, I've been working with, with both Clarences here for many, many years. And, uh, you know, Every time I listen to him speak, I learn something new, and I've known him for 30, 40 years, you know? And the whole idea is, is that 
you know, we sort of peel knowledge away like an onion, like layers. And eventually you might get close to the center. As soon as you think you're there, you're not. And so this, these are the kind of things that we have to work towards. And this relationship that we have is while we're trying to convey the spirit of our ancestors and to protect those spirits, at the same time, we're, it's the living spirit of our cultures, not only our ancestors, but our descendants as well, because we are the voices for all of those people as we speak here. And in our voices, when you hear us speak, it's all of those voices that are there. And so that's that's what we have to try to try to convey as we do this sort of collision of cultures and understanding as it relates to the, the whole academic world and, and the, the, the traditional spiritual world that we, that we live in. And we have our own tribal bureaucracies too. I mean, we don't always get along with our own governments. I was a chairman for 14 years, believe me, I, I understand, <laughs> you know, but these are things that we have to pay attention to. And I just wanted to make that observation and uh, see if there were any comments, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. We're going to take one final question up here at the front, and then we'll have to wrap it up. We've got lunch coming in. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Pijat Debina, no Deborah Harry, Minania, no Kuyui Dakata. Good day, everybody. My name is Deborah Harry. I'm from a place called Pyramid Lake in Nevada, uh, and I work with the University of Nevada, Reno, as an associate professor there. Um, I understand that this uh, work is um, geared towards um, the museum professionals. And I think um, similar to um, what Roshan uh, Downs said, I'm looking at what's missing. And I think one piece that is missing uh, besides the path to repatriation is the contextualization of how museums came to be in uh, control of these uh, things that have been uh, taken from indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have to be honest in truth telling mm -hmm. to talk about the atrocities of the colonial legacy um, and to talk about uh, its roots in white supremacy. And to say that these, also to say that these things have been stolen, uh, they're stolen items that belong to the cultural heritage of indigenous peoples. And the cultural heritage of indigenous peoples is inherent and inalienable. And so therefore the purpose of this work is to move towards the repatriation because these things have been wrongfully taken from us and from our control. And that that should be the priority of your work. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I see that Secondly, I see that this is an attempt to say, try to decolonize uh, the way that the, 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 the field is being, um, is being run. But a part of the decolonization work has to be that respect for the right of self-determination of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And that means putting indigenous peoples in the decision-making positions mm -hmm. around all of this work. And I, from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing, uh, that hasn't happened yet, and that absolutely has to be your next step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I respond? Can I just no, respond on, super, yeah. super quickly? Sure. It'll we'll be really Go fast. And I just want to thank you guys, and we're not the experts. Everything you've said has been heard. It's been recorded. I hope the next time we speak with you, you see some of these changes reflected back in our work. And I want to commit to you that we're taking in what you say and we will, we will make changes. So thank you for your time. Thank you thank so you. much. Can I just, sure, the audience. can I just ask a couple questions? Is that okay? Um, <clears throat> is it okay if you could meet with us individually? We're trying to wrap up. We could maybe go into a conference room in the back. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just also wanted to respond to the last comment and, and say, I believe the, 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 I recall a very important conversation that this group had and the, the, uh, the words that we use were colonial collection practices. And I was very adamant about truth telling and having those exact words in this guide. And it is 
Um, as an Ojibwe woman, um, I find it's very important to me that we're having these conversations about truth telling and when we're sitting in these, um, these work group calls and there are indigenous people represented on this work group and that this will then be taken out into community so that everybody that would like to has an opportunity to put th their thoughts and their heart and their minds together for this guide because we know and we understand that most of these items were taken without free prior and informed consent. And this guide will just be uh, another tool in the process, right? And I, I just wanna stress that, that there is indigenous representation in this group and that we understand as members of this group that we are not the end all be all, right? I do not speak on behalf of all indigenous people. I'm just Colleen. And so this will be brought into community and in that it is not only a priority for us, but it is crucial. This will be brought into community and so that our representation from indigenous people, from you all to give your opinions, to give your support, to give whatever it is that you feel like is missing. We want all of that feedback because if, if this isn't going to make a difference then why are we doing this, right? So I just wanted to add that. Okay, so lunch is being set up right now. Um, you're going to unfortunately have to hear my voice again because I'm going to give you some <laughs> updates on what the association has been doing this year for our repatriation programming and uh, where we're where we see ourselves going in 2023. Um, again, I just want to acknowledge all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, all of our cooks who are back there putting their love and their thoughts and prayers into this food to nourish our mind, bodies, and spirits. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to all the Four Winds staff who have been so helpful. To our tech crew in the back, these beautiful screens you see everywhere that in a very timely manner pull up everything. Um, we're so thankful to the tech team in the back. And um, again, get your raffle tickets ready because I, after my presentation, I'll be pulling raffle items. Um, and so as if I get the high sign that food is ready from some of someone in the staff, we're, it's a go. So uh, like I said the last two days in my language, we say, we time to eat. 